Right. Okay. Should we? Should we? Um. Should we crack on? Um. Welcome everybody to how to design electronics. Just got time here, but the there we go. Right. Have a little little time here that keeps an eye on things. So, uh, yeah. So th those who are new, and maybe people will will join in. Uh, just welcome to uh, episode six of. Uh, Make space in Cambridge. How to design electronics, and for those of you, just just a, a, a two second introduction. That um, these are monthly sessions. Uh, it's the first Monday of each month at uh, seven thirty p.m. Um, I was hoping to do this at Make Space today, but I didn't manage to get round to uh, working how to use their cameras. So. From April, it'll be at Make Space and it'll be a hybrid event. So um, it will actually be streaming online as well, which is great. So these events really are all about, uh, this is started during COVID, something to do for everybody. These events are about uh, my experience as an electronics engineer of about 30 years, about just giving you some top tips on designing electronics. That's what it's all about. Uh, I have to say, whenever I write these things, I always learn something new. So I'm kind of learning something new at the same time, which is great. These slides, um, well, slides, a bit of paper, actually. Um, if you want to download them at all, you can. If you just skip along to uh, Silicon Cortex website. And there's a, if you just scroll down, you'll see a section that says downloads. And then that will take you to how to design electronics and you'll find series one and series two. And um, this will be episode six. It'll say um, Opto Electronics. So you can just kick back for an hour. Uh, if you want to pop your microphones on, uh, you can. If you're going to take phone calls, don't forget to turn them off. Um, occasionally, in fact, we've all enjoyed someone else's phone call, which was great. And so this session is going to be all about opto electronics, a session I was asked to do. So what I'm going to start off with, uh, I've got five things for us to look at uh, today. So we, we do jump around a little bit. But to start with, um, we are thoughts. If anyone knows this chap, Finn at the top, bit of a giveaway. Um, light, because it's all about light. So I thought we'd try and recreate an A-level physics experiment. Um, so in 1801, I'll look this up, uh, this chap, Thomas Young, um, <coughs> proved that light was made up of wavelengths. I think it's wavelengths and particles, um, Deborah might correct me. But um, so I thought we'd do an experiment, uh, which I've got set up here that takes just a minute to prove, to demonstrate that light is made up of wavelengths. So 1801, um, how did he do it? Uh, this is a slightly modern day version of what he did. So that's a picture of the chap. Um, there weren't many cameras around in 1801, so this is clearly a painting. Uh, that's what just what it looks like. So to prove light is a wavelength, this is the experiment in 1801 that we're going to recreate just for entertainment to prove light has wavelengths. So what he did, uh, I've got it here, I'll adjust the camera in a second. What he did, he took a light source, which is just here. So this was his light source, beaming away. And we've got one of those we'll have a look at. And he shot it at a plate that had two slits in. So this is a glass plate. And I've got one here, I'll just show you in a second. A glass plate, and you put two lines in so the light could shine through it. He then projected that onto a uh, wall, maybe. And there were lines, I'm going to have a look at these in a moment, so I've got it set up there were lines appearing on the wall. And the question is, what do these lines mean? So I have got here, I'm just gonna adjust things here very slightly. So a bit of camera gymnastics. Be able to, uh, 
All right, bit of camera gymnastics. Right, there we go. We'll get a bit dizzy. Right, let me just point things out. So this here is a laser I'm pointing at. This is a, an LED laser diode. We're gonna have a look at those in just a moment as well. If you're just connected to a power supply, it's just three volt power supply. And it's shining its, its red beam, which you can just about see there, through this glass plate. And if I just adjust the camera here, you'll be able to see, hopefully, this glass plate. Um, is that working? You know what, let's just take it out a sec. Here we go. This is the glass plate. It's a bit easier to do it this way. So this is the glass plate here. Now, what I've done on here, I've basically taken a glass plate, I've spray painted it black, and I've essentially then scored two lines through the paintwork. So that's what the double slit part is in the description. And then I'm just gonna shine a laser light through this pattern here. So that's what I've got here. Laser light shining through there, and I've got it pointing at the wall, and we'll just do some gymnastics with this camera, and we'll see what we get. So this is proving light has wavelengths. Right, so I've just popped that back. Brilliant, right. So what we're going to go and have a look at in a moment is what's called constructive and destructive interference. So I've got a picture here just to try and explain it a little bit for us all. So what we're looking at is through this double slit, let's just draw it here. There's a slit there, okay, and the light is beaming that way. Yeah. So when we get... <coughs> Light wave, light, uh, describe it. The wavelength is in phase coming through the slits. Yep, that's called constructive interference. And when they're out of phase, then we get what's called destructive interference because as one goes down, one goes up. It's like pushing and pulling. So it just cancels itself out. Whereas this is both pulling and pulling and pushing and pushing, so things get better. So when we're going back to here, so well, how can this be? Well, if we come back to here, see if we were beaming light there, then obviously that distance is clearly a little bit further than that distance. And that's how we then end up with waveforms being in and out of phase, which gives us our constructive interference and our destructive interference. And just to prove that, I've got this set up here pointing at the wall. So we're going to take this camera and I'm going to walk it and I'll show you what you get for your money. So, there was the gymnastics. All right, so fingers crossed. If I spin that, oops, there we go. All right, let's see. Look, I think you can see that, can't you, on the screen? Okay, so you, you can definitely see. I'm not sure if my oops. If my mouse will work or not on the screen. Um, so yeah, so you can definitely see that in the middle it's brighter. And as you get towards the edges, you can start to see bands of light. So those bands, the red bands at the edges, and so in the middle, you can see that's the constructive interference. And where it's black in between the bands, that's the destructive interference. And that experiment is proof that light is made up of wavelengths. So there is the evidence. And this was first done in 1801. Zoom in a bit, please, Stephen, because zoom uh, in. I it's can try very clear yeah. on the screen. Yeah, um, hang on a second. Let me just see if I can zoom in for you all here a little bit. Yeah, it looks great on my wall, by the way. 
Uh, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit for us. There we go. Um, I'll just adjust that a second. Right, let's see if I can just... Uh... It looks much better on my, on my wall here. Can you see that okay, everybody? So you can see in the brighter, in the middle, it's always brighter in the middle. You can certainly see if you look towards the edge, certainly on the right-hand side of your screen. And it looks much better on my wall. My wall here, it, it looks fantastic. Um, but the best I can do with that camera is that. And of course, don't forget, I made this diffraction grating by hand with um, black paint and a pin and a ruler. Can you turn your... Um room light off just for a moment and see if that helps. Uh, I have turned it off, let's go turn that one off as well. Does that help? Yeah, that helps, thank you. There we go, there you go. There you go, that, there is the actual evidence of light is a wavelength. I was quite pleased about that. When I was looking through my uh, physics book, thinking, okay, what do I do on optics? And I thought, ooh. So I'll be honest, it's the first time I've ever done that experiment. I probably saw it when I did my A-level physics in 1989. Or was it 1991? That, that's when I did my long road. There we go, peeps. So that's interesting. Right, let's undo the gymnastics. I might get seasick whilst I move things around a little bit for you all. All right, turn that off. Right, okay, let's refocus the camera, shall we? Right, might just need to adjust that for us. Okay. There we go, brilliant. Okay, let's move on, shall we, from, from labouring that point. So, okay, so what can we do with electronics? That's why we're all here. So I thought maybe one of the first things maybe we might want to spend just a couple of minutes on is uh, LEDs. So light emitting diodes, the, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the godsend for all electronic engineers. So again, when designing electronics, uh, and this was interesting when I plotted this table out, um, Depending on what color LED you want and your type of LED it will very much dictate the applied voltage that is across it and how much current that it draws. And what I found interesting when I plotted this out, these are just generic values. You can get you know, LED, red LEDs that might only draw say one milliamp. Um, you might get some that can draw say 30 milliamps. So the moral of the story with LEDs is to choose wisely. And one of my own personal takeaways from this is green LEDs are clearly the most efficient. So if you're going to design a battery powered circuit, I would probably, again, something I always learn something you write in these, I'd probably err towards using a green LED for a battery is my own takeaway from this, because it's drawing the least amount of power, and power being voltage times current. And you can certainly see it's very clear that, um, you know, as, as you head towards the ultraviolet end, things start to get a little bit tasty. You know, for current, three volts, and uh, the infrared end, it seems to start to go up as well. So stay around there if you're doing a battery circuit, I, I think is the takeaway there. But uh, when I've been designing electronics in the past with batteries, one circuit I've used, and you can download this, I've, it's in the downloads. I won't explain how this works because I'm not entirely sure. But this little circuit here, whereas a LED, which you can see here, might draw, say, you know, a few milliamps, this circuit, will light an LED up on microamps. 
It won't be constant, it'll, it'll flash, it'll be a pulsing. So if you're using it, say, for power, um, then this will draw just a few microamps. I have used this in designs for products and uh, I can tell you it, it works extremely well. I've also used this circuit for battery monitoring <clears throat> where when the battery starts to well, loses its voltage and you want an alert, well, yeah, you could put an LED on it, of course, but that's going to start drawing current. So you're just making the situation a whole lot worse. Whereas with this circuit, you could, I'll just draw onto here, you could have a, um, a sensor here. Uh, th these sensor chips are, it's a low voltage, um, describe it, it's a low voltage switch. So it's just an open drain inside. And when it, when, it measure, when it measures a, I think that'll probably go up to VCC there. Yes, it would. And it's, I knew it had three legs. So I can't remember the name of this um, particular one, but essentially it's a like a low voltage threshold switch. So if your battery voltage was starting to drop, let's say it's a 1.5 volt, and if it gets to 0.8, it'll switch on. Well, 0.8 of a volt wouldn't even light an LED, of course, because the LED is about 1.8 volts. So part of your LED wouldn't even light. If you, if it did light, you'd start drawing a lot of current. Whereas with this little circuit, it'll still light the LED up because it's charging up this capacitor here, which is 100 microfarads. And then when it hits the threshold, it's then said to be dumping it across the LED. So you get this pulse from the LED um whenever the connection here would be tied to ground so uh useful circuit there let me share that with you uh lasers so uh the laser diode i've got here just grab that. there we go so here's the laser diode which i bought oh, i actually got out the drawer so um it's this all this little board here. So this this block on the end is the laser diode, and, and then this part on here this is actually a switch to turn it on and off. I've just bypassed it here for our experiments. So this part here is just a linear regulator, uh, and you could also just set the voltage for the regulator, and then it's just a smoothing capacitor on the output. So for an LED laser diode, that's all you need. And this one here runs on three volts at uh, about 20 milliamps. So, and that's DC. So nothing special to power a laser diode. And then you can make lightsabers, apparently. Right, okie Um, So that's LEDs and a few tips there. It'd be a bit remiss if I didn't talk uh, talk a little bit about about sensors. So the main sensors which I use are light dependent resistors and photo transistors. So a light dependent transistor. I left a blank here so I could do a little drawing for us. So there's a resistor symbol and lights coming into it that's what the arrows are like coming in that's the symbol for a light dependent resistor and what you generally find with them is uh let's see how would we do light here which is measured in lumens i believe and this will be the resistance r r l d r yep is that they're quite slow to respond LDRs and I'll have a curve which will probably look something like that. So that might be something like 100 kilo ohms. And that might be something like 10 kilo ohms or maybe one kilo ohm. So it's not, it's not linear for sure, um, but they are super cheap, which is great. They are used in, well, 
a, a lot of sensors use them just uh, when it's dark just to switch on uh, but they are slow to respond so if you've got something changing a quick light level changing and uh, the chance are it might not pick it up whereas a photo transistor um, oh, I should draw the symbol really, shouldn't I? First, we'll just have a look at the symbol just to remind ourselves. Oops, it is. So, for a phototransistor, again, a couple of arrows coming into it. Um, one's the collector. And then the other one, of course, is the emitter. Yep. So when light hits these things, these things uh, will change their, their impedance as well. Just about to draw this on here. Uh, lumens and the impedance between the collector and the emitter. And the, these things here will have a very sharp uh, transition. So if you're looking for something quick, speedy i'll probably go for a photo transfer but for some cheap and cheerful uh if i was just monitoring daylight i'd probably go for ldr so i think for transistor sensors that's all you will find Can anyone hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Great, yeah, it must have been. I just can't hear um, Stephen. Well, he'll probably rejoin in a minute or two. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, was, uh, are these sessions all recorded? I see this one is, but uh, was the previous one this is said to be the second one. Was this first one recorded? 
Uh, yeah, this is the sixth one of series two. Um, so yes, they're all recorded and you can dip back into series one, I understand as well. Hello, Stephen. Hello, Stephen. Can't hear you. You're muted. I am muted. Right. Do you remember me? <laughs> Hello. It just popped up on my screen. It went, um, well, you're not connected. I'm like, oh, not again. Uh, right, now then, I'll, I don't know how long I was talking to myself for. Um, did, we, did you catch me on photo census before I spotted the screen? It disappeared. We saw the uh, light sensitive resistor. And the oh, OK. Oh, jolly good. OK, right. In that case, um, let me just get my camera back here. Hang on. Uh, I pivo. I pivo. One second, everybody. I usually say at the beginning that because it's live, anything can happen. And uh, this is quite a popular one of suddenly, suddenly losing uh, me. Sometimes we lose the video quality, in which case someone's got to shout because it always looks great at my end. Right, now then, uh, let me just see if I can uh, get back to where I was. Right, share. Right, are we back in the saddle? I'll take that as a yeah. yes. <laughs> right, okay, my apologies, everybody. Um, uh, I'll keep a, a weather eye out on the screen. Right, yeah, so I was just finishing up there on photo transistors and um, light dependent resistors, and hopefully you caught that. Just a summary there is, LDRs are very slow to respond, um, but depends on your application and phototransistors are usually quite sharp to respond. So it's horses for courses. And you just get the data off a data sheet as to what the performance is. So that there's no real magic with any of those. They're very simple to use. So I was just going to move on then when I noticed things went a bit wonky was uh, photo transistors, photo uh, optocouplers. So these are electronic devices which will enable you to optically couple data between one part of your electronics and another. And what I mentioned before, but I, but I think I was talking to myself, <laughs> was um, you might want to connect, let's say, like a, a, a tablet, uh, you know, if you can get access to the communication, some, some you can to maybe your Arduino or your Raspberry Pi or anything like that. So if you've got voltages which are different, um, then you can use an optocoupler to connect the two. And I thought we'd just draw on this one here exactly how you do that. So um, probably I would connect one end here to, we'll call it VCC1. And this one here, we'll just do it to a transistor to make it nice and easy. That's zero volts, one. OK, so your signal would come in there. And you could turn that little LED on and off. And then this in the middle here is isolation. And then what you generally do is you tie this end to say zero volts to a different zero volts. And often with these optocouplers, they, you'll see they'll have sometimes called an open collector output, not always. But if it says open collector, or if it's only got four pins, then the chances are you're going to have to connect the collector which is that one there, and that's the emitter. You're going to have to connect the collector to a pull-up resistor, call that VCC2, and then that there, so that signal in, and that signal out. There we go. So again, no great secrets, dead easy to wire up, and this would allow you to have isolation between two circuits. So 
Uh, I've used this before but as a way of example. I designed a product, it's a medical product. We bought in a third party tablet that we had no control over. And so we decided the best way to manage the product approvals was to create an isolation between one part that we had bought in and the part which we designed, which we had complete control over. If we just had this all as a common ground or connected together, then we were stood the chance of just, although it would probably work, would probably have problems with our product approvals because there's one part we've got no control over. So it's a great way of isolating your electronics. What kind of voltage? Uh, what kind of voltage? Yeah, really good question. What kind of voltage? So um, again, this data, the voltage levels will actually be in the data sheet that you use. Yep. Um, but as way of, by way of example, you'll probably find, or in fact, that needs a resistor to it, doesn't it, actually? Otherwise, we'll blow it. Well, I should have a resistor in there. That's my mistake. B, C, C, 1. So you'll probably find that the voltage required here to switch the LED on will be something like 1 volt, probably. So depending, and typically, they might want to draw something like 5 milliamps. Again, it's just an LED in a box. That's all it is. And then the output. Uh, actually, I wonder. Yep, carry on, Greg. I wonder what kind of isolation voltage. I mean, uh, was this oh, the isolation voltage. Uh, they, they can be a few thousand volts, the isolation voltage. Yeah, this was, I was wondering uh, whether it's mainly anti noise or anti high tension. What sort of a breakdown would you have? Would it be uh, in kilovolts, say? Um, okay, so the ones I'd looked at, uh, for that, that the data sheet that I got this from, the breakdown uh, between this side and this side, if you're using it for isolation, on the one which I looked at is actually 3,740 volts. Right. But it, you'd have to look at the data sheets um, to find out what that isolation was. There's another great use of is, is isolation. Certainly if you're doing a medical product, uh, you'd want to isolate. If you were, say, had a power supply and you have wanted some feedback between the primary side of the mains, which is the voltage, the mains bit, and of course the bit that you touch called the secondary side of the mains, You'd want to have some isolation between the two, and you could certainly use something like an optocoupler for that purpose. Uh, yeah, coming back to the voltage on these as well. Um, again, you know, you'd want to have a resistor in there. I'd probably use something like a 4K7, 4.7 kilo ohms. But yeah, to answer your question, Greg, it's um, I'd look at the data sheet, but um, you know, they'll all be slightly different. But uh, that's probably the sort of thing you're looking for. Right, so I've got here some applications uh, on what you could use them for. So, again, it's really a case of having a dig around on the internet. Uh, this one here, you can have on one side, you can have data going out, obviously optically coupled between the two, and on the other side, it goes the other way. So, if you're using a UART, which is uh, communications on a um, microcontroller. There are devices which are designed specifically to meet that need. And the other examples of optocouplers, you can get some, this, these will be quad ones. So again, you'd have a bit of a dig around and this is the isolation bit in the middle. So. You could use something like this if you had wanted to optically couple um, SPI. Uh, we spoke about SPI a few, a few months ago, I think. So you'd have on one side, you could have, we could have your clock here, um, your uh, S clock, your clock here. You could have your master data out. You could have your chip select and you could have your master in. So data go that way, that way that way and then that way. 
And then on the other side, of course, there you go, you've got your clock. Oh, well, that'd be slaving on that side, wouldn't it? Chip select, always active load, chip select, don't forget that with SPI. And then this would be slave out. So this here might be your, your microcontroller. You see for microcontroller, and this here would be some device, or whatever it may be. And in fact, this is what we did on a medical product. So we had access to the SPI, which is serial peripheral interface. It's a communication protocol on every microcontroller you'll ever see that's worth using, I would say, <laughs> depending on what you want to do. Um, but yeah, so it's horses for courses. You have to have a dig around and um, say, uh, yeah, that's all I want to say on those really. They're, they're, again, they're dead easy to use. The, the principles are the same in all of them. And say so I've used them a number of times. Right, the last thing I've got here to share with you is on um, fiber optics. Now I've got one here for us. I'll be doing some work with this one. Here we go. Take a look at fiber optics as our last joy of the evening. So with fiber optics, why, why would you even bother wanting to use them? Um, there's loads of reasons to want to use, use these things. If you're sending data over a very long distance, um, you could use a fiber optic. It's just light. This is, you can usually buy them in pre-made lengths. As you can see, this has got two on each side. And just so you know which is which, because they're both orange, they've just labeled one, one and two. And at the other end, they've got it one and two. And if you do use these, keep the dust caps on until you need it. You can buy equipment to slice these things up and polish them, or you can just buy the lengthy ones in the first place. And what I will say when I look at the characteristics of these is that the fiber optics usually do have a characteristic curve. So this is attenuation. So this is telling me that for this fiber optic here, it's got a very low attenuation at around 650 uh, nanometers. And of course, 650 nanometers is red light, isn't it? So with this particular fiber optic cable, the material is very good at transmitting red light. <clears throat> and so at each end, uh, you have these, which I've got a couple here. Uh, again, they come with end caps. Always keep the end caps until you need to connect. You'll have one for transmit and another one to receive. What you tend not to find, unfortunately, is a single module that could do receive and transmit at the same time. I think there's a gap in the market for that. But these are, again, you just need to pull the ends off and uh, they're very easy just to, uh, there's, try not to break it. There we go. There we go. So, no, didn't quite go into it. There we go. That's it. Sweet. So, um, what can we say about these plots? Oh, one more, one more, one more page to share with you. The only thing I'll say about fiber optics is, if you're going a short distance then the cost of this bit is not cheap. But if you're going to go a long distance, then compared to the cost of cable and the interface electronics, fiber optics, in my view, then starts to become cost effective. But the other downside of fiber optics, of course, is the bend radius. So you know, if you had a wire, well, there's one here kicking around, so obviously, you know, I've, I've got a very small bend radius on wire. I wouldn't dream of doing that with a fiber optic because I'd probably go and break the cable. Uh, I think uh, make space, I think um, if you ever go to pop into make space, uh, I think there's a, like a drag chain on the right hand side on the wall when you go in. Uh, I'm pretty sure the, we've got a fiber optic 
um, Ethernet cable uh, running around the place. So the other thing which I wanted to share with you, just the last thing here, um, is uh, this is a, a an Arduino board here. <clears throat> How could I connect uh, a fiber optic to it? So it's no great secret. In fact, you could use this one, the one I've got here. But these modules here are in fact these two. And this is just a resistor for the LED inside, because it's just the an LED in here, like that. Yep. That connects around to there. That's all I've got there. And I'm just connecting the UART, the output, to there. And then at the other end, I've just got a very simple photo transistor. And this is, if you remember saying earlier about open collector. So this will just be a, uh, an open collector uh, photo transistor. There'll probably be a little bit of electronics in here as well, but not too much. And then that would, you just connect that up to your uh, receive. So that's all you have to do. So really easy to use fiber optics. Um, the other great thing about them is the, because it's a light that you're transmitting, uh, there's no you know, electromagnetic interference being emitted and there's no interference that's gonna get onto the cable because it's light, it's, it's, not, it's not a wire. So if you've got an electrically noisy environment, then that would definitely uh, solve your problem. If it's over a long distance, if I just had a short distance of a few meters, I'd probably still use a cable, if I'm honest. Okay, um, that's, that's what I've got for you. So, um, any questions for anybody? Anyone would like me to go over anything again? I've got here just to remind you as well. Uh, yes. All these slides, they, they are available, just pop it there just to remind you. They are all available to download, so you can go and grab them in the circuit, which I had at the beginning. Yeah, so go ahead. Uh, yes, I, I was asking earlier on where all the talks are. Are they, are they all at that address? Right, so um, probably in two places. The, the slides that I present and put together, is it spend about a day writing these things. Um, everything which I present, present here is available to download for sure. Um, it's, it's there right now. If you were to pop onto my website and just scroll down to downloads uh, and then click on that, it'll take you to this called Box, B-O-X, and you'll see how to design electronics in there and it'll say series two and then number six of course is today's so that they're all in there and any time for you to download um, it'll be there permanently that's great thank you and anything else i can go over again or share with you you want to see anybody all very quiet so are you designing anything in particular, Greg? Sorry? Are you designing anything in particular? Not at the moment. I'm just, I'm traditionally more of a software engineer. I'm trying to summon up the nerve to experiment with hardware. So anything I can learn is interesting. Um, I'm scared of smoke. <laughs> well, uh, batteries are good. <laughs> Well, in fact, you know, batteries are good to avoid smoke. So at the moment, uh, one of the things I've been playing with since uh, I've got no questions as yet, and uh, we've got a little bit of time. So, um, so this is one of the things I'm experimenting with at the moment. So uh, th this here is the Raspberry Pi Pico board. This is a microcontroller. Um, I mean, the other one which I've been playing with is this one here. This is the Arduino. Bit of glass there. Um, this is the Arduino um, uh, Uno board. I, I've modified this one to run off 3.3 volts. So, you know, if I want to tinker with some hardware, um, these are two extremely good choices. Uh, this one you can buy for this little board here um, is it's something like three or four pounds. Um, are, are you in Cambridge, Greg? 
No, I'm near Edinburgh. You're in Edinburgh. Okay. Um, sounds, it sounds like you're down the road. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, um, so you, you can go on to Farnell or I think the Raspberry Pi. I think they call it the Pi Hut. I'm, I'm worried to promote Raspberry Pi, by the way, or anyone else. Um, but you could go to the Pi Hut dot co dot uk let me just yeah. check that have you seen that at all there's a few of these as pie hot pie maroni and yeah 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 all, all all those all those so this is the one which i've just been picking up recently so this um a bit i've been setting this up i'm starting to write a an ebook um because to program this you need to use something called micro python yeah, you can do it in c plus plus or or c um so I guess as a software program, you'll be familiar with probably Python and C++. So this is, so this you can use micro Python and it's got the UART on it, it's got SPI. So I've, I've actually just started to look at this particular, well, more, I'm more interested in the chip. So I, I've just put some LEDs on it and a switch and I've got an I2C and a temperature sensor on here. And in fact, this is, this is my UART on here. Just to try and understand it. So you could grab something like that and just, just explain that. I think you'll probably find there's like various modules you can just plug in and tinker with. Or um, you can get something like the, the Arduino Uno board, which is quite a bit more, it's about 18 pounds. Uh, but if you just want to experiment on your table, I'll be honest, I would probably at the moment go with the Arduino Uno. Although I think this is a much better chip, the Raspberry Pi, uh, it's called the RP2040. I think it's a much better chip. But what I will say is I, my experience so far is the, the, the means to write your own micro Python code, the information on it is a little bit scarce and not very well presented everywhere I've looked, which is why I thought I've started to write a book on how to use it. Whereas at the moment, it's probably because it's been around a lot more, the Arduino Uno has been around for many, many years and there's a ridiculous amount of support to, for tinkering with it. But this only got 32K, Greg, uh, of flash and 2K of RAM. Whereas this, I think it's just 256 of RAM. It's got no flash on board. So there's a, a little chip on the side, this tiny little black square. So this is the flash. So there's no flash inside. It's actually external. Whereas on here, it's internal, but it's only 32K. So with this one here, you've got to think like a 1980s engineer with his ZX Spectrum or your BBC Micro. These ones here, um, your interpreter, um, uh, if you're using MicroPython, um, sits actually on the chip. And it doesn't, because it's a cut down version of Python, it's, it's only a few tens of K, I think. So they've done a pretty good job, um, but I think the support um, has got a long way to go before um, you can start writing your own sort of electronics for it. But for both of them, there's, there's tons and tons of plug-in boards you know, that you can have a tinker with. So no, don't worry too much. Hey, uh, anything else, anybody? All quiet. I've, I've bamboozled you all. <laughs> Yeah. I, I was uh, I was wondering if there was anything on a YouTube channel. Uh, quite a lot of organizations like yourself are doing YouTube clips. Um, uh, for, for for these two platforms, that, to say that there's an absolute mountain of stuff for the Arduino. Uh, there's a mountain mountain of stuff for Tinker Time of this. And there's lots of modules, um, black boxes for the Pico. Um, but it's uh, a, little, a little bit more in my experience so far. Um, I've had to do quite a bit of digging to get the information I want for this one. 
there are there are plenty there's a ton of youtube videos but if you're not that comfortable with the electronics um i would probably err towards playing with one of these boards although it's say 20 quid i'd probably go that route if if to get to get to get your feet under the table and then migrate onto this once you're happy with this because you can get lo loads of little plug-in boards for these ones here much better for the plug-in boards in my view i'm sure that'll change i, I think it's only been out a couple of years this one of course we've had covid for two years haven't we so you know i, I think we'll forgive the fact there's not a huge amount on this one that's very useful at the moment and i, I found the books which i've bought a couple and sent a couple back for the raspberry pi pico uh, I, I think the literature at the moment is a bit poor right it's my honest appraisal yeah yes i know it's a uh, recent recent yeah exactly exactly but as i say i think overall i think this is a much better solution in the longer term but i think it's quite a long way to go before uh, it can rival the Arduino for its forum. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Well, look. So the next session is the sixth of April. Uh, I'm going to try and get hold of somebody at MakeSpace. So they can show me how all the computers work because uh, we can join from Edinburgh. You don't have to come down to Cambridge. We'll still be online. Uh, so I've a bit of a tinker and uh, it's going to be on connectors and cabling which somebody asked me to do which um, it might sound slightly boring cables cable connectors but um, I'll say if you want your electronics to go wrong definitely put a cable on it uh, I do a lot of stuff with EMC and uh, I'm telling you cables are the undoing of everything I've seen so many. That's like if you look on this one here, and there we go. Look, just, just, just to, uh, to look. so this one's here. We'll talk about this next time. So you, you see these funny blobs that they be on cables, uh, particularly USB cables. So this is actually a lump of um, iron in here, and it'll be tuned for a frequency usually somewhere around sort of thirty to fifty megahertz is pretty common. And you, you find this on cable. So this is to try and reduce um, electromagnetic uh, interference coming off cables. So that's why this has got one on here. It's a sticking plaster to not designing the electronics properly, is what I would say. So we'll talk about more about this next time, but just to whet your appetite, you can either fix a problem in the electronics with you know, when you cable and get that right for a few pence, or you could spend a few pounds and put clamps over it and it still not be quite right. Uh, I think it's slightly obvious you want to try and fix it in your design. So we're definitely going to have a look at all that in a bit of detail next time. Okay, uh, any more for any more? <laughs>